third lecture in the preoperative pain management series. This is Dr. Abdullah Turkawi. I'm currently a pain management fellow at Stanford University. In this lecture, um, I'm going to talk about um, postoperative monitoring for patients who receive pain management. And we're get, I'm going to cover a few uh, special situations, including um, elderly patient, pediatric, pregnant, morbidly obese, chronic pain or chronic opioid users, and survivors of abuse and torture. And finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about handling controlled drugs. Again, as a reminder, the whole series geared toward practitioners in limited resources uh, countries. However, most of the science still applied um, for any practice anywhere. So it's very important to monitor patients who receive pain management. Why? Number one, to continue managing their pain as they respond. And number two, to detect any side effect to medication the patient received, mainly respiratory depression. So documentation here become very important. When you give any medication during anesthesia or after anesthesia, it's very important to document what did you give the dose, the amount, and everything. And then when you write orders, make sure you give a detailed sign out to the nurse or whoever will take over about what medication you gave and what's the plan, where you're gonna, and, and of course the timing. It's routinely recommended to monitor the five vital signs, if you remember, temperature, heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate, and uh, pain scores. And of course, pain scores at rest and activity with any medication that has been given during the stay, during the recovery, uh, in the recovery room, or in the floor. Look for side effects and document them if they happen. And finally, give instructions to, uh, again, the patient and uh, the staff about um, the plan, the possible side effect, um, the concurrent use of other CNS depressant uh, parameters to trigger a uh, notification for the uh, uh, physician and uh, emergency analgesic treatment if PCA or any medication you give fails. Here let's talk about um, elderly. Elderly patients with dementia, those who are frail or both, are more likely to have their pain under treated, which can result in adverse outcomes such as poor sleep, impaired cognition, increased disability, depression, and reduced quality of life. Postoperative delirium occurs in about 10 to 60 percent of patients with a higher incidence in older patients. In patients with more advanced dementia or with significant postoperative delirium, observation and measures of pain-related behavior should be initiated if the previous method mentioned have failed. It is always important to know the patient baseline cognitive function. Multiple studies show that the elderly have a great likelihood of respiratory depression than younger patients. Other possible side effects of opioid um, can be magnified uh, in elderly. However, Opioid in younger patient, um, um, certain side effect in younger patient like nausea, vomiting, pruritus seems to be less common in elderly. 
this table summarizes the changes that happen with age and how they affect um, the pain management. So if we, look to, if we look at the cardiac system here, we have a decreased cardiac output, which means we have decreased sympathetic response following epidural or spinal analgesia. Decreased cardiac output also can lead to higher peak arterial concentration of opioid after IV administration. On the liver, we have decreased um, phase one metabolism, decreased blood flow, decreased liver mass, which means decreased hepatic metabolism of drugs. Um, renally, we have a decreased um, GFR and clearance, which means increased plasma concentration of renally cleared drugs like most of your opioids and NSAIDs. CNS, we have a net loss of neurons, which means decreased conduction velocity through peripheral nerve system that make increased sensitivity to local anesthetic with neuroaxial and peripheral nerve blocks. The lungs, um, uh, in the respiration system, we have a decrease in respiratory center sensitivity, which increases the incidence of ventilatory depression with opioid. This table um, summarizes um, the pharmacokinetic changes with some of the most commonly used um, analgesics. For example, um, fentanyl, uh, volume of distribution increase, clearance decrease, so the duration effect will increase. Morphine the same. Uh, local anesthetic, uh, we have increased uh, volume of distribution, decreased clearance, and increased duration. Ketamine, increased volume of distribution, decreased clearance and either increase or the same duration. In states, we have increased volume distribution with decreased clearance, so the duration will be almost the same. It's important to know that the incidence of renal failure increases in the presence of pre-existing renal impairment, low serum albumin level, hypovolemia, hypotension, and concomitant medication, including NSAIDs, diuretics, and AC inhibitors. In elderly, the dose of non-selective insects should be reduced by 25 to 50%. Elderly patients are at greater risk of GI adverse effect, including ulcer, bleeding, perforation. The risk of GI bleeding from the use of non-selective insects is approximately twice as high in patients older than 65. A reduction, a reduced dose of opioid is generally also recommended in elderly because of age-related changes in pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics as I show you in the previous slide. So a 50% reduction in clearance a reduction in protein binding and increase brain sensitivity to the effects, increased effect of opioid can be seen in elderly patients. Patient age rather than patient weight can be better clinical predictor of postoperative opioid requirement in this population. Meberidine or pethidine should be avoided in patient with renal impairment as we remember from the last lecture, because the metabolites tend to accumulate. We also should reduce the dose of ketamine and make sure we turn it off enough time before the end of anesthesia if we really want to wake up the patient at the end of the surgery. Let's talk about pediatrics. Children suffer from postoperative pain at least to the same extent as their adult counterparts. It is now well documented that new nays are born with the ability to perceive pain as they have considerable maturation of the peripheral, spinal, and supraspinal afferent pain transmission neural pathway by 26 weeks of gestation. Studies in new nate have shown that pain, if lifted untreated, can lead to amplified 
physiologic or behavioral response to make sure um, events as well as the development of chronic pain syndrome. So how we should assess pain in kids? The appropriate assessment of pain in children is the first step in the developing and effective pain management plan. Whenever possible, using a self-reported method remain the world standard. However, we have first to make sure that um, this kid will be able to understand and communicate our question. Usually, uh, kids above seven years old, they do okay with that, so we can't use the uh, NRS or the visual analog scale. However, Unit infants, children under three years old are unable to communicate, and we should primarily assess their pain via observing behavioral changes, like uh, and look at the facial expression, limb, trunk, motor response, verbal response, or combination of behavioral, physiologic, and autonomic uh, measures. As we know. Most of the kids, when they wake up, they wake up crying, even if they don't have surgery. Um, especially when they wake up, they don't see their parent. It's a, it's a different environment for them. Um, so they may cry and they may develop agitation. So it's important to understand why the baby is crying. And not every crying baby means that they are in pain or they need... Um, to give them opioid or a strong analgesic. There are multiple um, tools to assess pain. Um, I'm gonna show you a few of them. I don't have any recommendation as I didn't see any comparison between them. However, I'm gonna show them a few of them and it's up to you to pick one or two and to use it in your practice. This is the numerical rating scale and the visual analog scale, uh, as we mentioned it. And here, this is the neonatal infant pain scale. You can use it for children less than one year old. Basically, you look at facial expression, and you have zero and one. You look at the quality of baby crying, breathing patterns, arm movement, leg movement, and state of arousal. Based on that, you make the math, and if the patient has a score three or more, that indicate pain. This is a, another very simple um, tool to use called the neonatal facial coding system. And you look at the, the brow bulge, eye squeeze, nasolabial furrow, and open lips. This is another one, behavior scale for scoring post-operative pain in young children. Again, you look at the face, the leg movement, activity in general, crying, and consolability. I would probably recommend this if the score is three or more that you should consider intervention. If the score is five or more, that indicate um, greater pain. This is another one, but it's more um, complicated. So as we know, the liver and the kidney are the most important organs responsible for drug metabolism and clearance. JFR is diminished in the first week of life, resulting in decreased drug clearance. Although neonates are born with most of the hepatic enzymes intact, there is delayed maturation of enzyme system involved in drug conjugation. This affects a neonate's ability to conjugate most analgesics, including opioid and local anesthetic. The weight normalized clearance of several opioids is diminished in neonate and reach mature value over the first two to six months. 
Neonate and infant also have an immature ventilatory response to hypoxia, making them vulnerable to airway obstruction, hypercarbia, and hypoxia. The respiratory frequency fails to increase during hypoxia in infant. It is this important a neonate who received opioid should be monitored by continuous pulse oximetry. This table summarizes some of the commonly used pain medication in pediatric, and the, the, here is the, the oral dose and the IV dose. This table summarizes the doses for uh, PCA if you use it in, in pediatric. And here is another warning in red color from the FDA who said tramadol should not be used to treat pain in all children younger than 12 years and children younger than 18 years after removal of tonsils and adenoid. However, as I mentioned in the previous lecture, no such warning was given by the European agency and other, in other countries. When we talk about neuroaxial block, the most common one is the coder block. It's the most popular and useful neuroaxial block in, in kids. This reliable, safe block is appropriate for surgeries procedure below the level of the umbilicus. The needle penetrates through the sacrococcygeal membrane into the sacral hiatus and into the epidural space. Cauda equina is infiltrated with local anesthetics. This table show, show you um, some of the local anesthetic dosing, the maximum dosing that you can use for caudal and uh, peripheral and epidural in kids. Children are very responsive to pain reducing strategies that involve their imagination and sense of play. Nowadays almost all the kids they like to play with phone, iPad, so distraction by giving them phone or iPad to play or show them a song or sing a song with them or give them a toy will be very important. Therefore, the involvement of child life specialists who are trained in the myriad of non-pharmacological technique is essential or a nurse who are expert on in dealing with kids. Let's talk about pregnant women. A critical period in pregnancy covers the first trimester and the third trimester. First trimester, the biggest problem is the potential for teratogenicity, while the third trimester, the, big, the biggest problem are um, we always afraid about this medication influence on the newborn, especially when we talk about premature closure of uh, ductus arteriosus. Generally speaking, acetaminophen is very safe, paracetamol. NSAIDs, on the other hand, since they inhibit the synthesis of certain prostaglandins and thus may have some adverse effect, especially in the second half of pregnancy, although the results of the clinical trial are not conclusive, however, it's better to be on the safe side. So NSAIDs are not recommended in women planning to conceive and during the first trimester as they may increase the risk of miscarriage according to several studies. Inses are contraindicated in the last two to three months before the expected delivery date due, due to the risk of premature closure of the ductus arteriosus and pulmonary hypertension in newborn. Codeine and tramadol, the prodrugs, are commonly used for postoperative analgesia. However, they are not recommended shortly before delivery due to the risk of respiratory depression in newborn and a prolonged use in the prenatal period might incur the risk of withdrawal syndrome in newborn. Codeine is no more recommended during lactation 
a fatal respiratory depression has been reported in an, in an infant whose mother took analgesic containing codeine during lactation and belonged to a rare group that rapidly metabolizes codeine to morphine. Morphine, generally speaking, is safe in terms of poten potential teratogenicity. Regarding its use, the same apply as codeine uh, for the potential of um, inunate addiction and uh, respiratory depression. Pethidine are also not recommended due to long-term ad uh, long administration lead to neurobehavioral changes in infant. This picture summarizes um, some of the commonly used medication during anesthesia and which one we can proceed, which one we should um, monitor closely, and uh, which one we should avoid, as, we, as I mentioned in the previous slide. And as we see here in ketamine, we really don't have data, so we don't have a good recommendation for ketamine. Let's talk about morbidly obese patients. The incidence of obesity is rising, rising worldwide. Consequently, increasing number of patients with obesity and morbidly obese who present to elective and emergency surgery. So it's important to have a background how you're going to treat their pain. Morbidly obese is associated with the physiologic changes affecting multiple organ systems. These changes impact the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of commonly used perioperative drugs. If we look at the CNS, we have increased sympathetic nervous system activity. Cardiovascular, we have a higher circulating blood volume, higher cardiac output, hypertension, potential left ventricular hypertrophy, higher risk of atherosclerosis with subsequent coronary artery diseases and heart failure, and higher risk of pulmonary hypertension, especially in those who have OSA, obstructive sleep apnea. Hematology, we have polycythemia, hypercoagulability, respiratory, decreased FRC, ERV, increased oxygen consumption, CO2 production, increased minute ventilation, chronic hypoxemia, atelectasis, OSA, and obesity hypoventilation syndrome. GI, who have a larger gastric volume, lower gastric pH, gallbladder disease, NASH, endocrine, higher insulin resistance, and so on. Renal, glomerular hyperfiltration, and impaired uh, natiuresis. Patients with morbidly obese can experience opioid-induced ventilatory impairment with opioid-centric pain management strategies. This condition presents as sedation and respiratory depression attributed to opioid administration, combined with upper airway obstruction and hypercapnia. If this remains undetected or untreated, it can result in increased perioperative morbidity and mortality. When we talk about pharmacokinetic, the volume of distribution of most analgesic drugs is altered or altered in morbidly obese patients. This is partly due to the larger increase in adipose tissue in comparison with the increase in lean body mass. Pharmacodynamics, with or without sleep disordered breathing and obstructive sleep apnea, this patient population is particularly sensitive to sedation and are at a higher risk of opioid-induced ventilatory impairment. This concomitant administration of benzo and opioid should be avoided in the operative period. In general, regional analgesic technique, when possible and appropriate, are recommended to minimize the use of opioid and sedative, particularly in those with a history of OSA. Patients with OSA are increased risk of respiratory depression when opioids and sedative are administered. For morbidly obese patients with OSA, it might be prudent to use local anesthetic without opioid for continuous opioid analgesia. 
although this decision depend on the individual patient's surgery and epidural coverage. The following table summarizes the various scalar that has been suggested for commonly used energetic in patient with uh, in, in morbidly obese patient. You can pause here and look at uh, uh, the, the scalar dosing for different uh, medication, whether you give it as a bolus or infusion. It is recommended to um, use as much as you can non-opioid in treating this patient, uh, especially the fundamental analgesics like acetaminophen and NSAIDs. Um, to the right of the screen, you will see the modified analgesic stipulator for morbidly obese patient. As you see, fundamental analgesics should started with unless contraindicated. And you can you may use a weak opioid for moderate pain or severe pain, and the last resort will be the stronger opioid. Please always remember to use non-opioid adjunct that will affect the hyperalgesia like lidocaine and ketamine. The use of ketamine is recommended when possible in morbidly obese since it is almost devoid of respiratory depression and sedation side effect when administered in a sub-anesthetic doses. Lidocaine is useful adjunct in acute perioperative pain. It has, it has been shown to prevent analgesic property ac across a variety of operations. Again, education, reassurance, and setting a realistic expectation has been shown to correlate with an improvement in pain perception and overall satisfaction, not only in obese patients, in all patients. This table summarizes the recommendation for preoperative pain management in patients with morbidly obese, starting from preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative. Now let's shift gear and talk about patient with chronic opioid and user and chronic pain. The opioid-dependent patient will require an individualized plan for postoperative pain. Opioid requirement for this patient may be higher, up to three to four, more higher than opioid naive. Uh, when possible, a plan for postoperative pain management should be made in advance of surgery, including possible consultation with pain management. The American Society of Enhanced Recovery and Perioperative Quality Initiative Joint Consensus Statement was published just last month. And it's very useful and they uh, very um, um, approach their problems step by step. So let's go through that. I just summar I just I'm just presenting the summary of the, the report. So the consensus statement and recommendation. First how do we categorize and define opioid use in preoperative patient? This nice graph defined the patient according to the ONET classification. ONET stands for O opioid, N naive, E exposed, and tolerant. So as it sounds, you will define, you will categorize your patient into either opioid naive who never had an opioid in the last 30 days before surgery or opioid exposed who had any amount less than 60 milligram morphine equivalent in the last 90 days before surgery and finally opioid tolerant who received more than 60 milligram of morphine equivalent dose within seven days of surgery. Again, I put this reminder for you to remind you how to convert other op common opioids like oxycodone, pethidine, and uh, codeine, whether IV or uh, oral, to uh, uh, morphine. How should patient be risk stratified preoperatively for opioid-related adverse effect and poor outcome? Starting with the ONET, as, as you see in this slide, then we go um, to this risk stratification. 
using the on it plus looking for modifier um, uh, risk factors which include site, substance, and surgery. So, and by, by using this, ONIT classes represent low risk, moderate risk, and high risk group for opioid related adverse events and poor outcome. Addition of comorbid risk factor known to influence the risk of opioid related poor outcome uh, 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 modifying the risk uh, group. So, for example, if you have a patient who is an opioid naive, right, but has one modifier from this table, then it will be moderate risk. If you have a patient who is opioid naive but has two modifiers from this table, then it will be at high risk. Now, how do we optimize moderate to high risk patient according to the ONIT criteria before surgery? First, the, the consensus um, recommended weaning opioid preoperatively to the lowest effective dose. Second, optimizing and managing, managing psychosocial comorbidities before surgery. Then, individualize preoperative education to promote shared pain management expectation, identification of and communication with the patient, outpatient opioid prescriber to anticipate discharge needs, referral to a perioperative pain specialist before surgery for highest risk patient. What are strategies for perioperative pain management in moderate to high risk patient according to the ONIT criteria? They recommended an individualized multimodal analgesia pain management strategy, including regional neuroaxial when appropriate to minimize the use of opioid. Is opioid free intraoperative management feasible in moderate to high risk? patient according to the ONET criteria? Yes, it is feasible and they suggested that it might be uh, used. What are strategies for managing postoperative pain in moderate to high risk patient according to the ONET criteria? They strongly recommend the use of non-opioid option as part of comprehensive multimodal analgesia preoperatively. They also recommended the lowest effective opioid dose in postoperative period, avoid opioid dose escalation, the addition of opioid only in the setting of suboptimal analgesia after first line administration of non-opioid op options, and the use of non-pharmacological treatment of pain. What are strategies for managing postoperative opioid at discharge in moderate to high risk patient according to the ONET criteria? They strongly recommended limiting discharge opioid prescription to the expected duration of pain that is severe enough to require opioid. They also recommended postoperative coordination of opioid tapering with the patient outpatient provider. So this figure here summarize the steps. The first step, classify the patient using the ONET into naive, exposed, or tolerant. Second step, consider comorbid condition that may increase the risk such as psychiatric diagnosis and history of substance dependency or invasive and painful surgery. Third step, risk stratify into low, moderate, and high risk category. And fourth step, employee enhanced recovery pathway specific to risk category. Let's talk about treating pain in survivors of abuse and torture. Uh, 
And when we talk about surviving of abuse and torture, here we are talking about domestic abuse, torture in the areas of war or whatever. Um, I would start with, first of all, we really have a limited evidence-based practice or research in this field. As you can imagine, research in chronic post-torture pain should be clinically relevant as well as grounded in evidence and theory focusing on pain mechanism underlying chronic pain condition following torture and their relationship to torture method applied and specific torture induced lesion. Pain treatment in tortured in torture population should be recorded with systematic observation and broad outcome data in relation to clinical, functional, behavioral, and psychosocial factors. Even careful account of single cases can be useful. As we know, pain in general is a useful body mechanism to alarm us about something bad to avoid it. But in survivors of torture, this useful pain can be stolen by the damaged nervous system here through the amplified megaphone of psychological distress and experienced in a person of cultural barriers. In all individuals, to a varying degree, pain has biological, psychological, and so socio sociological element. All these elements are more uh, predominant and very important in church survivors. Effective treatment must address all three areas. And the best and this best achieved by using a multidisciplinary approach that includes psychotherapy, physical medicine, traditional clinical medicine. Establishing trust and effective communication can be challenging, but it is crucial. Not all torture leave a physical mark after the acute injury have healed. The most commonly injured, the most common injury with torture is blunt trauma, like um, uh, in the sole feet, which often lead to chronic neuropathic pain. Another common thing uh, for torture with uh, suspension, um, stretching the nerves, leading to musculoskeletal joint and soft tissue damage and flexopathy. So effective pain management require a team approach, again, with a careful um, and emphasis on the mental health issue, especially these people at a higher risk of post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and anxiety, and so on. Treatment barriers to overcome include language communication, cultural barriers, memories of helplessness, fear, and shame, impaired memory. Survivors may not offer information unless asked, non-compliance with treatment, and medication due to the past uh, forest to get medication. Findings that suggest torture or abuse, multiple chronic pain, multiple physical scars, complex injuries, musculoskeletal pain, headache, neuritis, depression, and anxiety, PTSD, neuropathic pain, as I mentioned, and symptoms frequently associated with pain, uh, uh, like poor sleep, fatigue, significant distress, cognitive dysfunction, and visceral disturbance. Effective treatment augmented by establishing trust, communication, evaluate in a calm atmosphere, be thorough during your history and exam, offer detailed explanation, obtain informed consent, allow the patient to have control in their pain management, ask patient about their belief about their pain, Pain may be assumed to be signal of ongoing damage. Set realistic goal. Use a stepwise approach. Avoid reinforcing addictive drugs. And avoid route of administration, whether IM or IV, 
that may trigger flashbacks. So always ask the patient first and let the patient contribute to the pain management plan. Finally, I'm going to talk briefly about handling control drugs. The NICE in 2016 published their control drugs safe use and management guidelines. As you see, the guidelines not only apply to providers, but it apply to organizations, society, non-healthcare setting. It's detailed and it's worth reading. I will only touch base on prescribing control drugs and handling control drugs. So when making decision about prescribing control drugs, consider the benefit of control drug treatment, the risk of prescribing, including dependency, overdose, and diversion, all prescribed and non-prescribed medicine the patient is taking. When prescribing control drugs, document clearly the indication and regimen for the control drug in the person care record. Check the person current clinical needs and if appropriate, adjust the dose until a good balance is achieved between benefit and harm. Discuss with the person the arrangement for reviewing and monitoring treatment. Be prepared to discuss the prescribing decision with other healthcare professionals if further information is required about the prescription. When prescribing PRN control drugs, document clear instruction for when and how to take or use the drug. Include dosage instruction on the prescription with the maximum daily amount and frequency. Ask about and consider any existing supplies the person has of when required controlled drugs. When prescribing, reviewing, or changing controlled drug prescription, prescribers should follow local, when available, or national guidelines and consider the appropriate route, the dose, formulation, and if guidance on prescribing is not followed, document the reason why in the person's care record. Prescribe enough of control drug to meet the person's clinical need for no more than 30 days. Document and give information to the person taking the control drug or the caregiver administering it include how long the person is expected to use the drug, how long it will take to work, what it has been prescribed for, how to use control drug when sustained release and immediate release formulation are prescribed together, how it may affect the person's ability to drive, that it is to be used only by the person it is prescribed for. Inform people who are start, starting control drug that they or they their representative may need to show identification when they collect the control drugs. When prescribing control drugs in primary care for use in the community, advise people how to safely dispose them. Handling control drugs. Records of handling control drugs. Keep records to provide an audit trail for the supply, administration, and, and disposal of control drug and the movement of them from one location to another. Providing information and advice on steroids to people prescribed control drugs. Provide advice and information to people who are prescribed control drugs about how to store control drugs safely. The person preference for a lo a lockable and non-lockable storage box, whether the control drug will be accessible to people who should and should not have access to them, whether the storage method could increase the risk of control drug related incident, including patient safety incident. 
witness and recording the distraction and disposal of stock in control drugs. Health professionals and service providers who are required by the, by the regulation must have an authorized person present to witness the destruction of stock control drug. When destroying and disposing of stock control drug, you must record the following. The name, strength, and the form of a control drug, the quantity, the date of destruction, the signature of the authorized person witnessing the destruction. Safely destroying and disposing of control drug. For stock control drug, when disposing of bottle, bottles containing irreversible, irretrie, uh, irretrievable uh, sorry, uh, amount of liquid drug, consider rinsing the bottle and disposing of the liquid into a pharmaceutical waste bin. Remove or obliterate labels and other identifiers from the container. Dispose of the clean empty container into recycling waste. Disposal of irretrievable amount of control drug not need to be recorded. When a person has died in their home and control drugs need to be removed from distraction for distraction and disposal in primary care, consider discussing the removal of control drug with a family member or caregiver, recording the action taken and details of the control drug listed in the person medical record, having a witness to the removal, any requirements of the coroner to keep uh, medicine in the person home for a period of time, taking the drug to a health professional such as a community pharmacist who is legally allowed to process his controlled drugs for safe disposal at the earliest opportunity. These are my references plus the one that I uh, inserted in the slides and thank you for your attention.